the earth. All right, if you have a Bible, let's go to Acts 14. I want to just speak for a few minutes uh, to fuel our faith in the area of miracles. The topic I want to preach on is where are you sitting? Where are you sitting? Acts 14. And Father, I thank you as we are turning to the Word of God tonight that your Word is alive, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. I ask you to anoint my lips of clay to speak as your oracle. Anoint the ears of your hearers to receive and to hear the Word that will produce faith, which will lead to a miracle in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's read. In Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting. I want you to pay attention to that. A cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. The topic is where are you sitting? I want you to ask somebody around you, where are you sitting? Because I think this is an essential ingredient to the supernatural is where are you sitting? I remember in the first church that I pastored, there was a woman that they brought to me and they said, uh, uh, this woman has got terminal cancer. Well, we used to have uh, uh, all night prayer meetings and every Tuesday prayer meetings and once a month healing services. And so I said, bring her to the healing service. They brought her to the healing service and she was healed of terminal cancer. And after she was healed of terminal cancer, she went back to a church that not only did not believe in healing but preached against healing somebody say where are you sitting and so she went back to the church that preached against healing and months later they came to me and they said you won't believe this but the woman now has cancer again it was gone the doctors verified it but now the cancer has come back and I and they said will you pray for her and I began to say yes I will when I heard the voice of God say this to me the voice of God said do not pray for her I said, why, Lord? He said, she does not have faith to be healed, and she's not going to be healed this time when you pray. And if you pray for her and, and you claim that she's going to be healed, it's going to be a bad testimony. Now, you might say, can you explain that to me? I don't really understand it. I just know what God told me. And so where the woman was sitting got in the way of where she wanted to go. And sometimes with us receiving the financial miracle, the family miracle, the mind miracle, the marriage miracle is going to be predicated Upon where are we sitting? I wonder how many of us are sitting on Instagram. And the joy of our life is dictated by a free app on a phone. We're not even dealing in the reality of what is, but we're watching somebody else's analysis. Where are we sitting? I wonder how many of us are sitting in worry and doubt and despair and unbelief. And we muster up enough hope to get to a service like this and, and just pray that God could touch us. And he's so kind and he's so gracious that he will touch us. But the question becomes, where are you sitting? I meet people all the time that ask me questions. Should I move here or should I move there? Should I move here? Now, I'm not going to say this is a law, but I remember years ago being cultivated by the fathers of faith and people would come and say, should I get the surgery or not get the surgery? And I can remember the fathers of faith saying this. If you have to ask the question, generally there's your answer because if you're still in the asking stage, you're not firm in your faith and what you believe. And I believe many times we are sitting in the wrong spaces and places. This man was a cripple, but he was sitting in the place of faith which tells me sometimes what's going on with me sometimes what's going on with you looks nothing like what God said about us maybe we are sitting and we're not in our right mind yet God said you have the mind of Christ sometimes we are sitting in economic despair and frustration we released the seed and we gave the tithe and we shouted and we Jericho marched but we're still sitting in that place of despair but here's the thing uh, if I am sitting in the place of faith then what's happening in the natural realm is subject to what comes from the dimension of the spirit all I've got to do is get myself to the place this man was crippled which tells me this if he was crippled how did he get there how did he get there he couldn't have gotten there on his own because a crippled man can't walk so somebody 
had to get him to a place that was conducive to his miracle. And the reality is this. You've got to get some people in your life that know how to war for you and with you. You don't have time for unbelieving Judy to tell you what won't work. And I've tried that. And, and the, that faith stuff doesn't work. And that supernatural stuff is not of God. I don't have time for that. Because you see, I'm standing in a position of dire need for my family, for my mind, for my ministry, for whatever it is that you are believing God for. You've got to get some somebody that will get you into a space where you can sit in an environment that has the potential to shift the trajectory of your life. I wonder how many of us miss the miracle because we won't ask for help. I remember when I started my first church, I was pastoring in a particularly rural and religious area and people would get upset and they would say things like, well, I was sick. And nobody from the church came. I said, did you, did you call one of the elders or did you call the secretary? Did you text anybody? Did you tell? No. Well, how in the world is somebody going to know your problem if you wouldn't ask, well, y'all should be prophetic? Well, it's interesting. The Bible does not say let the prophets discern who's sick and go pray for them. The Bible said, let the sick call for the elders of the church. It did not say, let the sick call for the elders of the church to do a home visit and have a lengthy conversation. It did not say, let the sick call for the elders of the church to do counseling. You know, I get frustrated when folk have issues and needs, and I'm sitting with them trying to help them, and I can't get a word in edgewise because they're telling me everything wrong with the world and ministry and the church. And I remember as a young man, there was a woman that called when I was working for Dr. Hayes, and she said, I have demons, and she began to describe to me, and I clean it up as best I can uh, that there was a substance coming out of literally every orifice of her body because the power of the devil was so strong in her but every time I began to open my mouth and speak to her she began to talk over the top of me and this went on for several minutes and finally Miss Denine I said to her ma'am I don't have anything coming out of the orifices of my body I didn't call you for a prayer you called me for a prayer you've got the problem you've got the demons so now let me give you a word from the Lord be quiet that's not really what I said be quiet in the name of Jesus so you can get your deliverance because see what you knew already got you to where you're at let the sick call for the elders of the church the reality is that the supernatural requires our participation and we're not going to get the miracle and get the breakthrough if we're not willing to call out for help do you realize that in order for the sick to call for the elders of the church, they have to first say, I'm sick. Do you know, the first step to deliverance is the recognition there's a problem. And then you can't box God in. Well, God's got to deliver me this way and that way, this way, this way. You know, I remember, and I'm not trying to be mean, but I've been alive long enough to remember certain things. I remember being in services with the great generals of the faith who are now dead that you didn't actually even have to call for deliverance before people started manifesting. I remember people trying to stab the preacher in services I was in. And you couldn't be an usher in those services and not pray. You had to pray because you had to be on alert and know who was going to do stuff before they ever started doing it. I remember people punching preachers. I remember people growling like dogs. I remember people crawling. I was preaching one time in Kansas, and a woman fell onto her back, and under the power of the devil, started to move like a crab across the front. I've seen those things. I remember a man about 250 pounds that when I laid my hands on his chest, his eyes transformed into that of a serpent, and, and the pupils turned into the snake eyes looking at me, and his tongue darting in and out. I remember those things, and now we think deliverance is just cute, we can just go and, you know, just somebody get a bucket. It's like when folk fall out, but they turn around to see if there's an usher before they fall. I don't know what Holy Ghost y'all got, but the Holy Ghost I got, sometimes just knock a person down and there's no usher. And if you're in the spirit, you ain't going to feel it either. You're going to get up well. But if you're just doing a courtesy fall, you might have a problem. And I'm afraid some of us do courtesy deliverances. You can't tell God, well, it's got to be this way and that way. No, when you're so desperate for your miracle, you will just sit yourself in a place, in an atmosphere to say, God, I need help. This man was impotent. Lame. Have you ever been so frustrated 
because other people are advancing and you're still stuck. Other people are praising and you're still angry. Other people are rejoicing and you're still weeping. Other people are leaping and you're still bound. And sometimes it can be so deep that you get frustrated by other people's freedom. Some of us are emotionally impotent. We come to church and praise God, but we're as a shell on the inside because we're still stuck in the person that left us. We're still stuck in the church that split. We're still stuck in a relationship that did not work. But I came to say tonight that as we are celebrating the resurrection, you serve a God that is bigger than emotional despair, distress, depression, anxiety, and fear. And you may be emotionally impotent, but the power of God can come upon you. You need some people that are willing to walk with you. Why are we unable to walk with people through the difficulties? Who said people were going to come and be perfect? You were not perfect when you came. You're not perfect now, but after we've been saved a year, two years, three years, five years, now we look at folk that come, well, they shouldn't be on the prayer team because I know they're still struggling. Well, thank God they're just trying to pray and not just going and submitting to their struggle. Some of you could not have went to David's worship conference because David was still battling lust while writing the song of the Lord. Now you become a professional Christian critic. Everybody ain't got the Holy Ghost or they don't have enough of the Holy Ghost so they don't have the right Holy Ghost so they don't talk right and do this right. And do, do you remember when Jesus first found you that you were bound? I can remember going to church and feeling like the least worthy person in the building. Thank God there were some people that in my spiritual and emotional impetus drug me to the house of God and did not judge me. Why can't we let God deal with people in their process? How can you deliver somebody you don't like? Well, I just don't like so-and-so. I don't like so-and-so. I don't like so-and-so. God's not asking you that. God is asking you, can you sit with somebody in their tormented stage, in their broken stage, in their stage? I remember when a witch came to the church, that, that uh, the first church I ever planted, and said, I want to come out of this. And we prayed for her. And it wasn't one time. It was almost daily. And thank God, you know, there were some women. Thank God for women. It was women that did not leave Jesus during the crucifixion. It was women that wanted to anoint his body. And so, thank God for Holy Ghost Spirit-filled women. May God raise up daughters in the church. May God raise up sisters in the church. May God raise up mothers in the church. If you're 70 and 80 years old, mother, God is not done with you because we're dealing with a generation that is acting buck wild in the house of God and we need some mothers that remember sanctification and holiness and the fear of God. So we got some praying women and they would pray with her. Not one time, not two times, not three times, not four times, not five times. Can I tell you, it was frustrating. It was irritating. Every time the power and anointing of God would start moving in our church, she would manifest. But we kept on working with her. And do you know she ended up going to Bible college and working in the ministry because somebody decided to sit with her in her impotence and war for her soul can you sit with people that are still in their process this man was sitting crippled from his mother's womb who had never walked listen it's one thing to have high blood pressure it's another thing when your eyeball ain't never worked your ears have never heard because you don't even have the hope of what it could feel like for it to work because you have accepted the condition as reality. This man had never walked. But the Bible said he heard Paul speaking 
Now this is a fight that we are all going to go through. What voice are we going to listen to as we've assembled on this evening or on the morning whenever you're watching the replay or the live the question is what voice are you going to speak to because you see I may still be bound in my mind but if I listen to the right thing long enough eventually it's going to move from my mind into my heart and when that thing hits my heart deliverance begins because see real deliverance doesn't just come from the hands of another real deliverance comes when revelation transforms your soul and you begin to be set forth in your right mind and I came to this miracle gathering on resurrection Sunday to tell somebody just keep on listening just keep on praying just keep on believing you might not see power working now you might be frustrated you might be irritated you might be ready to quit your family might think you're crazy your friends might think you got demons but if you'll just keep on listening and keep on praying and keep on seeking God eventually the power of God is going to come upon you and when power comes upon you the power of God will make war with the power of hell and the power of hell is no match for the power of a resurrected Christ I came to tell somebody with cancer keep on listening I came to tell somebody with anxiety keep on listening I came to tell somebody that had a nervous breakdown keep on listening I came to tell a frustrated preacher keep on listening I came to tell a witch keep on listening I came to tell a warlock keep on listening I came to tell the one bound with pornography keep on listening don't you go outside the house of God sit in the house of God in the midst of your pain in the midst of your process in the midst of your warfare you sit in the house of God and keep on listening I need somebody to shout keep on listening right in the comments keep on listening he heard Paul speaking. I believe in every miracle. There are two conversations. There's the conversation of the disease. Think about the word itself. Dis-ease. You are uncomfortable. Being sick is uncomfortable. Being depressed is uncomfortable. Being anxious is uncomfortable. And there's this inward voice saying, you've always been this way. Everybody else is this way. The, you, there's no hope for you. This disease is incurable. This thing is just the way you've been born. They're saying it to you on TikTok. They're saying it to you on Instagram. Government officials are confirming it. Medical science is documenting it. That's the voice that will try to abort your deliverance. That's the voice that will try to stop your process. But in the midst of that conversation, there arises another voice. This is not a voice, as James wrote, with sensual wisdom of man. But this is a voice born from the ages of eternity. This is a voice that supersedes all creation because it's the voice of the creator. And that voice is crying freedom. But the problem is we're living in a noisy world. And in this world we're living in, there's a lot of voices. And it takes intentionality. Sometimes we need to say, shut up. I refuse to listen to what you're saying. Paul heard, the man heard Paul speaking. And Paul, observing him intently, let's stop right there. How many of us take time with the broken? Paul was observing him intently. Something about this man's need spoke to the faith of Paul the Apostle. I don't know it because it's not in the text, but I feel somewhere Paul had a knowing. God sent this man to this meeting. If nobody else gets their breakthrough, if nobody else gets their deliverance, if nobody else gets any help, I am sent to this man. And Paul observed him intently. And the Bible said, seeing that he had faith to be healed. Now, I want to ask this question. How did he see it? The Bible doesn't tell us. I want to submit to you that I believe miracles only happen where there's faith. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4.13, seeing that we have the same spirit of faith. You see, faith is not a decision. Faith is a spirit. I remember my spiritual father, Dr. Hayes, saying to me one time, 
he said, uh, Ryan, you cannot believe God just because you want to. You can't just get up and say, I just believe God I won't have cancer. This is where we don't get the miracle. We think faith is a decision. But if we think that faith is a decision, then we are making what is spiritual mental. And it's not in the mental realm. Because faith is not born of the loins of man, but faith is born from the halls of heaven. And faith, the Bible says, is a substance in this particular scripture. The Bible said, faith is a spirit. So when I get around faith people, when I'm sitting with people of faith, when I'm sitting with people of prayer, when I'm sitting with people of the prophetic, when I'm sitting with people of the spirit, what's on them begins to come off on me. Now conversely, on the other side, when I'm sitting with unbelievers, when I'm sitting with frustrated Christians, when I'm sitting with uh, criti- professional prophetic critics, what's on them tries to get on me and then I become mean spirited, then I become unbelieving, then I become hateful, then I become frustrated. But you see, if you sit in the right place, you will hear the right thing and if you hear the right thing long enough, it will begin to lodge from your head to your heart and faith will arise. We have the same spirit of faith. According to what is written, I believed. You need to get this. Before any miracle happens, somebody has to believe. I believed. Therefore, I spoke. Believing always leads to speaking. That's why words are the most powerful force in the universe. That's why many of us are still struggling with words that were spoken over us as children. Somebody said, you have a learning disability. You never got over it. Somebody said, I don't love you. You never got over it. Somebody said something that broke you. You never got over it because words are the most powerful thing in the universe. And the Bible said, I I believed and therefore have I spoken. That's what the spirit of faith is. We believe and speak also. And so Paul was moving in faith and it began to well up in this man. But Paul observed or felt he had faith to be healed. He discerned the faith of the man. Now perhaps the man was doing something. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I believe it was deeper than that. I believe it was something in the realm of the spirit. I believe that miracles often involve realms of discernment. We just, I don't know how to explain it. We discern that there's an atmosphere. We discern that there's a moment. We discern that there's something we discern that something is happening because you see every miracle happens in a moment but you've got to learn to recognize the moment you can never maximize what you don't recognize and thank God you've got an advantage because the Bible said you can be led by the spirit of God because you're a son of God or a daughter of God so you don't have to wait for a preacher to call your name come on you don't have to wait for somebody else to call you out what you've got to do is say I discern that it's my moment I'm going to get what God has for me if I get it in my seat if I get it online if I get it down front I discern it's a moment but you got to move in the moment because the devil wants to keep you stuck in the past but you see your miracle is in a moment but the moment requires recognition and recognition demands movement Paul discerned this man had faith you see those with eyes to see will have the ability to move in the supernatural Moving in the supernatural is not easy, but yet it is easy. Once you learn it, it becomes a second nature thing to you. But it doesn't mean there's not challenging times. I remember the night I was preaching in Belize, Central America. I was getting ready to walk up on the stage, and the Spirit of the God said to me, remember the first great miracle you ever saw in your ministry? I said, yeah, Lord, it was a blind lady healed. He said, tell the story. Don't preach your message, just tell that story. Well, why would you tell a story and not preach? Jesus was a storyteller and stories built faith. We overcome him by the word of uh, the, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So when we testify, it lets people know it's possible for them. So I began to tell this story and I'm telling this story in a room of about four or five hundred. And as I'm telling this story, Sam, I hear these words. I'm telling the story. I don't know why, but I'm just telling the story. I've taken the pulpit. I'm telling this story. As I'm telling this story, I hear these words come out of my mouth. And tonight, I'll do the same thing. And when my mind heard what came from my spirit, my mind said, are you sure of that? But you see, to be prophetically driven means you see the window of opportunity. You see the moment. Many of you think you're crazy, but you just see. You just hear. 
You're just aware. So while other people go, I'm afraid and I'm trying to figure out how to survive this next storm. You've already seen the breakthrough that is coming to you. And you said, so I know that there's about to be a famine in the land, but God already told me he's going to put me by a brook cherub. I've already been in prayer about this thing. I've already sown my seed. I've already done what needs to be done. And when the moment comes and other people are paralyzed by faith, you are moving supernaturally. What speed are you moving at? You're moving at the speed of the Holy Ghost. Some of you think you're behind, but God said you're right on time because you're moving, moving not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God, and you are going to be right on time. It may feel like you've been delayed. It may feel like it's been too long, but I hear the Holy Ghost say tonight, you are right on time. Someone tell your neighbor, neighbor, you are right on time. You're right on time. So I'm telling this story. I'm telling this story. And God says, call the blind. I said, the, all the blind come. We're in a room of about 400, but we're in another nation. We're in another nation that doesn't have the same medical care we have. So to my amazement, it's not one or two people. It's a small line of people. And as they come, my eyes land on a young lady with an empty eye socket and a white eyeball. And I heard the voice of God say, she's going to be healed tonight. I didn't know how. I didn't know when. I just knew what I heard. And when I heard it, I said it. Why? If I'm going to get in trouble, I might as well get in trouble big. I remember preaching in India after the tsunami. Many of you don't remember that. I don't remember what year it was, but there was a tsunami that came because of an earthquake. It came so strong after the, the tsunami left, the whole makeup of the beach was different. And I went to preach on the site of that tsunami in a home. And I was preaching, and these people were looking at me like I was crazy. There was hundreds of people in a home. They had moved all the furniture out, put speakers. People had lined up everywhere. And I found myself saying these words. I'm going to pray for every deaf person tonight, and all of them will be healed. And if they're not, I'm a liar and my God is not real. Now that sounds like a nice thing to say in America, but the problem is where I was preaching, people get arrested for preaching the name of Jesus. I could not even go on the right visa. I had to basically not tell the government what I was doing and go on a tourist visa. I was told don't tell anybody at your hotel why you're here. Don't tell anybody because prior to me getting there, there was another more famous preacher that came and the pastors that hosted him, the radicals in the nation, took their children and murdered their children and murdered some of their wives for hosting the man of God. So it may seem like a bold thing to say, but it was a life or death thing to say. But nevertheless, I said it because it came up out of me. And I remembered that night every single death Hindu in that place was healed by the power of Jesus. And after they got healed, all of them got saved. That night in Central America, when I looked at that woman and said, and tonight you will see, I then prayed for her. And I didn't close my eyes because I thought, you know what? If God is going to do this, I want to see it. I had preached in another country, and God poured new skin on a woman's body. And I never got to see it. The pastor started screaming at the top of his lungs. I said, Pastor, why are you screaming? He said, because this girl's been in my church since she's a small child. And I just watched every open sore on her body get covered with new skin. And he saw it happen. I didn't see it because my eyes were closed. So I determined I wasn't going to close my eyes. So I'm praying and nothing changes. She's still staring back at me with a white eyeball and an empty socket. But she says, I can see. Now I'm thinking, how? So just to check, I said, I'm going to hold up fingers. Tell me how many. And I hold up three. She says three. I hold up five. She says five. I'm still not sure. Isn't it amazing how dumb we can be sometimes? So I said, follow me. And I start walking, but I start walking like this and abstract patterns, and she follows me. Somewhere in all of that, somewhere we had an idea well, check what is she seen from. So she covers the empty socket, and she's seen from the white eyeball. And I don't know how it came to me or came to her, 
But then we decided, have her open the empty socket and cover the eyeball. She's opened the socket, and I say, how many fingers do you see? Three. How many do you see? Six. She had never seen the face of her parents because she lost her eyes as an infant with a fever. Her parents came up that day, and for the first time, she saw them. You say, how does that work? I don't know how it works. It just worked. Now, some of you are too young to know this. I'm really too young to know it, but it was told to me by older preachers. There was an evangelist many years ago that had a glass eyeball, but God healed the nerve in the socket, and he could see without the eyeball. So when he would preach, they would tape the eye closed, he would take the eyeball out, and he would preach and see people and read his Bible and talk to people, and people would come and get saved by the droves because they never saw a sign like that. When I was preaching in India, I was preaching in southern India. Southern India is more Christian than northern India, which is dominated by the Muslims. The reason why southern India is more Christian than northern India is because the apostle we call the unbelieving apostle, Thomas went there and preached. But Thomas eventually got faith. And when the Indians would not believe him, Thomas, as folklore says, threw up water and said, if I command the water to stop in the name of Jesus and it stops, will you believe? And they said, yes. So he threw water up in the air and said, in the name of Jesus, stop, and the water froze up in the air. And they got saved. Well, there's a famous preacher named Howard Carter was the protege of Smith Wigglesworth. Carter is preaching in England and gets in from a meeting tired and gets in the meeting and uh, gets in his bed and the pipe starts dripping water on his head. Carter gets irritated because he's been preaching and he's exhausted. And Carter gets mad and says, in the name of Jesus, stop dripping. And the drop stops in the air. Carter doesn't stop there. He said, go back up in the pipe and seal up. And it went back up in the pipe and sealed up. God has authority over weather patterns, molecules, environments, atmospheres. Lester Summerall had been preaching, was tired, came in. If you don't know who he is, look him up. He was the great deliverance minister of his day, one of them. He was preaching, came in tired, and a demon or demons came in his room and picked his bed up and started shaking his bed. Shake his bed and move it across the room while he's in it. He said, in the name of Jesus, stop. They drop the bed. He says, get out of here. They go out. Then he gets mad because he realized now his bedroom is messed up. His bed's supposed to be over here and it's over there. So he says, demons that were in here earlier, come back in in the name of Jesus. Pick this bed up and put it, put it back where it was before you moved it in the name of Jesus. And the demons pick the bed up and put it back and he tells them, drop it and get out. That's authority. That's authority. Where are you sitting? Where are you sitting? Paul discerned the man had faith to be healed. You see, to move in supernatural realms, we can't move with the natural eyes. We've got to move with the eyes of the Spirit. If we're going to move in the miraculous in our life, it takes some ingredients. Number one, there's got to be an act of faith. It can be the most simple thing in the world. In Central America, it was me saying, and tonight God's going to do that. Sometimes faith is you getting in the building. Sometimes faith is you sowing the seed. Sometimes faith is you praying a prayer. Sometimes faith is you kneeling down by your bedside. Sometimes faith is agreeing with somebody. But there's an act of faith. You see, faith always acts. That's the thing that separates faith from hope. Hope says, well, I, I hope God will do it. That's not faith, my friend. That's just simply entering the realm of possibility. But faith is a conviction that God already has procured the thing. And then miracles will usually involve a release of the anointing. Now, I don't have time to talk about the anointing, but the anointing is God's super on your natural. When you are anointed, you can do what you could not do. I've seen people under the power of the anointing run that could not run. I've seen people under the power of the anointing do all kinds of things. I won't tell all the things because some of you will be like, I don't know if I believe that. But when the anointing of God comes on you, you can do what you could not do. This is why when Saul got in the midst of the prophets, he started prophesying because the prophetic anointing came. Now, one of the things we have to understand, there are different types of anointings. There's an anointing to prophesy. There's an anointing to heal. There's an anointing to deliver. There's an anointing to preach. There's an anointing to teach. There's an anointing to pray. If we would learn how to partner with different kinds of anointing, 
It would be powerful. I remember the first worship leader I ever worked with. We used to have a once a month healing service. And I would tell her, listen, we're having a healing service. Don't sing songs about anything else. Sing songs about healing. This is back in the 90s. And she'd come in and sing, I'm a friend of God. I said, why did you sing, I'm a friend of God? I felt led. I said, well, let me help you with that revelation. I'm the leader, so I'm going to help you feel led to sing about healing because that's what the point of the service is. And what you sing about and what you preach about is what's going to happen. So you have to learn that. Sometimes when the anointing gets moving, you have to be quiet. Sometimes when the anointing gets moving, you scream. Sometimes different people do different things. And sometimes people think, well, she's not in the noise. Read Ezra. They cried, they shouted, they laughed, they wept all at the same time. Because when the cloud comes in and the anointing of God is moving, it's going to affect different people differently. That's why I get so frustrated with all of these professional critics that think they've seen everything God wants to do. And so if somebody falls out and, and cries, they, oh, that's kind of, no, 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 that's a demon because I've never seen that before. You better be careful. Because the Holy Spirit does not like being called a demon. Just because you haven't seen it before doesn't mean it's not in heaven. Well, why do people do strange things under the anointing? Because when your natural body contacts a substance that is not made of this earth, sometimes your body responds. You may shake and tremble. There's a whole teaching now that shaking is the one. And I, I, I'm, please hear me. I, I really struggle with the level of stupidity it takes to come up with this. Because if you go into the book of Acts, you find they came out of the upper room appearing drunk. That's why the people go, these are drunk. And Peter has to preach. Go, they're not drunk as you suppose. He never said they weren't drunk. He just said they're not drunk on natural liquor. Well, why would God want to make you drunk? I got news. Because when you're drunk, you're bold. When you're drunk, you're not depressed. When you're drunk, you're not afraid. And listen, when you're drunk, you don't feel pain. Sometimes when God wants to operate on you, he puts you under an anesthesia before he does the hard stuff. I could take you through the Old Testament where the prophets fell down on their face. They didn't say, oh, I think I'm going to fall down on my face. No, no, the power of God went bam and they fell. I could take you through the Bible and show you instances of people shaking. Conversely, it amazes me Pentecostal people preach that nonsense because if you study the roots of Pentecost, this is exactly what happened. In the days of William Seymour, the glory cloud came in so thick, children were running in the cloud and playing in the cloud. Playing hide and seek in the tangible cloud that was in the services. A man came to one of the services that was missing an arm because a machine had ripped it off in a factory he worked in. And when that cloud came in, a new arm popped out where the man had no arm. In Cane Ridge, Kentucky, which is actually the site of the first Pentecostal outpoint in the United States of America, you can go there and you can go to the meeting house and it is written in history that women shook so hard under the power of God, their hair cracked and made the sound of a horse's whip shaking under the power of God. Yet we now want to criticize what we don't understand. May God bring shaking back to the church again. May God bring the kind of move of the spirit that you are in, you're laid out and they got to carry you to the car at 3 a.m. because you're caught up in another realm. You're caught up in another dimension. May God teach us about the anointing, that there are different types and realms and levels of anointing and we haven't seen everything yet. Listen, in 2024, we haven't seen everything yet. What God is getting ready to do is going to be things we've never seen and never experienced in our generation. But may we have a humble heart to say, God, I'm going to sit in the middle of of your presence like the lame man did and I'm going to receive what you want you see when the anointing is released there's a point of contact someone say contact we lay hands on people as a point of contact we speak the word we anoint people with oil we give out prayer claws let me, let me finish this up Paul perceived the man had faith and said with a loud voice stand up straight on your feet notice he did not lay hands on the man. Because there's a level in a realm you don't have to touch people. 
Now, touching people is the most common way to administrate the power of God because it's the most biblical way. It started in the Old Testament and goes all through the New Testament, laying hands. Laying hands not just for healing. In the Old Covenant, they laid hands for blessing. The fathers laid hands on all the children to do what? To bless them. Sometimes we need to just say, Sunday night we're not preaching, we're going to sing a little bit, and then we're going to lay our right hand on every single person, all the children, bring all the kids out of the church, bring the aunts, bring the uncles, because we're just going to bless everybody. Why? Because when we do that, we're invoking an ancient practice, and we're releasing divine power upon their lives. We are undoing what's been done in this world. So when we sit in the house of blessing, we are undoing the lies of bondage, we are undoing the lies of fear, we are undoing the lies of torment. It is a point of contact, and Paul did not pray. Pray it. Paul said it. And sometimes there's a command of faith that we just say what God said. We speak the word. Paul said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And the Bible said he leaped and he walked. You see, a miracle is the divine intervention of God in the ordinary affairs of life. It's a sudden turnaround. Miracles are not limited to physical healing. There's economic miracles. There's multiplication miracles. There's relationship miracles. There's restoration miracles. There's mind miracles. So don't limit the operation of the miracle working power of God. Where are you sitting? Sometimes your situation looks so dire. Your life seems to be so full of distress. But if you'll just sit in the presence of God, sit under the word of God, sit in the midst of the people of God, or sit even at your home, listening to God, talking to God, tuning your ears, sit with your Bible and reading the scripture, sit with God and let God undo the lies of the devil over your life. Where are you sitting? Because there's a voice that wants to come and declutter your mind and declutter every other voice, the voice of God. And tonight, I believe the Spirit of God is saying to us online in this building, it's time to sit in His presence. It's time to sit under the power of God. It's time to sit under the anointing of God. I, I want to say something, and I say it with all respect. Another entertaining gathering is not going to bring the deliverance you need. Don't, no, I need you to hear it by the Spirit. I heard a preacher say this. And I believe it to be true. He said, because the church has lost the anointing, we're pulling rabbits out of hats. And so now we keep having to figure out, okay, I jumped off a stage. Now I got to come and hang off the ceiling. After that, okay, now they're going to have to fly me and drop me out of a helicopter. Nothing wrong with finding creative ways to tell stories. But my fear is that we're being entertained but not changed. The old timers may not have had LED screens. They might not have known how to do illustrated sermons. Some did actually. But they had the power of God. May we be a generation that returns the ark of God to the house of God. Maybe we be a generation that experiences the power of God. Because we're not serving Buddha, Muhammad, or any other dead God. We're serving the living God. Amen. Will you lift your hands in your home online in this building? Father, we thank you for the spirit of faith. The same spirit that raised that man up off his lame legs and caused him to walk. And tonight we declare we are sitting in your presence. We are sitting in your promise. We are sitting in your glory. We are sitting in your peace. I speak over every sickness, infirmity, pain, disease, affliction. We prayed for many already, Lord. You've healed many. And I believe that many are being healed even now. And I loose the anointing of God. I say be healed in the name of Jesus. Arthritis is leaving somebody's shoulder and neck right now. Asthma is being healed under the power of God. Fallopian scar fallopian tube scar tissue is being healed right now receive the anointing of god childhood trauma i can see it specifically but i'm not going to call it out to embarrass anyone childhood trauma is being put on the operating table of the holy spirit and being healed let god's water wash over you be healed now in the name of jesus i thank you that captivity is being broken tonight 
I thank you that bondage has been broken tonight. I thank you, Father, on this Resurrection Sunday that freedom is the announcement that you're making. I pray for mind miracles. I pray for family miracles. I hear the Spirit of God say it's time to release people from offense. Some of you are mad at somebody. You're offended with somebody. And I hear the Lord say it's time to let it go. 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 I want you to make up your mind right now. And in the realm of the Spirit, I want you to release it. Some of you need to send a text. You need to make a phone call this night before the clock strikes midnight. To say, look, I forgive you. Because it's not worth, it's not worth you carrying this thing any longer. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We thank you in the name of Jesus. We thank you that freedom is our portion. I release the freedom of God over our lives right now in Jesus' name. Precious Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. God said, I'm releasing joy where there's been pain. I pray for every family right now. If you need God to do something in your family and you're online or in the building, just put your hands up and if you want to write online, write online. Father, I thank you for family miracles. Miracles of salvations and miracles of deliverances in families and miracles of freedom in families. In the authority of Jesus' name, we loose the anointing of the Holy Spirit over families I thank you for economic miracles that this won't always be where we are that this is nothing more than just a temporary landing place because you're bringing increase and multiplication in the name of Jesus and I thank you Lord for your anointing I feel him so strong 